Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about the formal definition of a limit. In this lesson, we'll explore the formal definition of a limit. Previously, we defined the limit with intuitive terms like approach and goes to. Now the gloves are off and it's time for some really technical stuff. However, I want to point out that few students, very few students, will have any use for what's in this lesson, let alone during a pre-calculus level course. I want you to have the option to know the formal definition if you're interested, but most people will not need it even in math class. Problems based on the formal definition of a limit are extremely rare in calculus class. Maybe as a bonus question, but probably no more. This stuff won't come up in science classes, and it will only be necessary for high-level college math. And when I say high-level college math, I mean that this stuff's really going to only definitely start showing up by the second or third year of taking advanced college math courses. This stuff is not going to show up anytime soon. So I really just want to be frank with you and upfront that what I'm going to teach here is really a totally optional lesson. It's not going to come up in the course that you're currently taking. I guarantee you that. And it may or may not come up in the next course you take if you go on to take calculus, but it's really, really unlikely to be like tested heavily. It will maybe like a bonus question, maybe one real question, but for the most part, you're just not going to see, see this like formal limit definition stuff. It just doesn't show up. It has very little direct applicability in the sciences. It's only used for some pretty advanced ideas in mathematics. It's really important for like building advanced ideas in mathematics, but for day-to-day -day use of mathematics, you just never really need to see it. So unless you're particularly interested in mathematics or you know that you really want to go into high-level physics or you're interested in something like computer programming where you'll have to get enough mathematics under your belt at some point that you'll wind up needing to be able to understand those advanced math concepts, you're probably never going to wind up encountering this formal definition ever. And that's totally okay. Uh, wanting to learn this sort of stuff, I know it's not for everybody. But for me, I personally love this stuff. This is the reason I love math, is because there's these really cool, complex, strange, puzzle logic ideas that like make this really interesting structure that's just fascinating to me, at least. So I think this stuff is totally awesome. If you're not interested, don't worry about it. Skip this lesson. There's going to be some really difficult stuff, and there's not really a whole lot of direct personal need to understand it. But at the same time, there's not really a whole lot of direct personal need to go to a museum. You do it because you're interested in art, right? And that's the same reason that you might be interested in mathematics. It's the reason I'm interested in mathematics. It's just because I find it personally satisfying and cool. So if you're interested, let's rock. Let's go check some stuff out. Okay, and before we keep going, I just want to say for those of you who decided to stick around, uh, thanks. I think this stuff is really, really cool. I'm glad to get the chance to share it with you. And yeah, I think it's really, really cool. I hope you wind up liking it as much as I do. Uh, we few, we happy few, we mathematicians, we get to see this. All right, so we're going to need some new Greek letters before we get started. That's right, this stuff is so cool, we need to break out the new Greek letters. So our first one is delta, and both of these are the lowercase versions. So delta, lowercase delta, and lowercase epsilon. Here is delta, and if you're going to draw it by hand, it's kind of hard to draw this thing exactly as it winds up getting typeset. So I would recommend just sort of you want something on the top and then sort of a curved loop like that. You might wind up see, see me write it like that as I'm writing it pretty quickly, but that's a pretty good idea of what you're going for. This one was kind of not a very good one, but some sort of curved loop on top and then a sort of circular thing on the top on the bottom. And that'll be enough for most people who understand mathematics to realize that you're trying to write delta. You don't have to have it absolutely perfect because they'll know what the symbol is, especially when they wind up seeing it a bunch of times. Epsilon's considerably easier to wind up drawing. It's just sort of a backwards three. That's kind of it. So that's epsilon. That one's easier than delta, I would have to say. All right. So the formal definition we're about to see involves these letters. So it's sometimes called the epsilon delta definition of a limit or just the formal definition of a limit. We just talked about the intuitive idea of what a limit is, and that's a really great way to think about limits, but sometimes you really need to get down to brass tacks and turn intuitive ideas into precise things that you can say this is what it is, and that's what this definition is for. All right, let's get to it. Formal definition of a limit. Let f be a function defined on some interval a to b of the real numbers where a is less than b. Let c be contained in a to b, and let l be a real number. Then, the limit as x goes to c of f of x equals l means that for any real epsilon greater than zero, there exists some delta greater than zero such that for all x where zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c, which is less than delta, we have the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Wh what? Wait, what? I, I mean, what? What? 
don't worry. <laughs> if you found that definition confusing, that's exactly how I felt when I first heard it. The first time you see this, you're like, what is going on? That's totally okay. It's something that you pick up and you work through slowly over time. If you opened a book for the very first time, you wouldn't expect to be able to understand every word on the page. It's something you have to work through. It's okay. You're building up these ideas of understanding it. It's not something that's going to make sense exactly the first time. It's something that makes sense over time. That's totally fine. So we'll start working through it step by step and we'll see some ways to understand what's going on in this definition to see how we can parse this thing and make sense of it. All right. First, let's get the basics out of the way. The groundwork here, the first half of the definition is just setting up the limit. That's what we wind up getting in this first half. Let f be a function defined on some interval a to b, the real numbers where a is less than b, and c is contained in a to b, and l is some real number. All right, so let's break that down piece by piece. First, f be a function defined on some interval a to b. So that just means that it is a function and it's defined over some portion of the reals, right? There is some piece of it that it winds up working in. It's basically just saying this function is defined somewhere. That's all we're saying is there's some chunk of the reals where this function makes sense. This part where we say a is less than b is just a guarantee that we don't accidentally say a equal to b and we wind up having something that doesn't make sense. It's so that we know that we're going from some a up until some b is our interval of where the function is defined. Next, the horizontal location C contained inside of AB. Remember, this symbol just means inside of. So AB is a set of possible values. It's the interval. And that symbol just means C is inside of that set of possible values. So the horizontal location C contained inside of AB is the value that the limit will approach. So that's the thing where we are getting closer and closer to that, and we're seeing where we wind up going to. So C is just the location that we're getting towards. That's the value that the limit will approach. And finally, L is some real number. So L is real number is the vertical location that we wind up going to. So that's where the limit will go to. We're setting the L that we are saying our limit winds up going to as we approach this C. So that's the basics that we're setting up. F is some function. It works on some chunk. C is where we're going to. And L is the value that we wind up meeting up at, that we are headed towards. All right, the hard part is the second half of the definition. So limit as x goes to c of f of x equals l means that for any real epsilon greater than 0, there exists some real delta greater than 0, such that for all x, where 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus c, which is less than delta, we have f of x minus l less than epsilon. OK, to break this up, we want to be able to focus on this one piece at a time. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the epsilon portion first. It'll be easier to understand that. And then we'll see the delta part in that idea. So for any real epsilon greater than 0. So what that means is if we just grab some epsilon, we just say some number like 1 or 1 half or whatever number we feel like saying, we'll wind up having this be true down the road, that the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Now, that might be kind of hard to understand. Absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. We're not used to working with absolute value that much. It's kind of confusing. But remember, one of the things we talked about when we first talked about absolute value is absolute value is a way of seeing the distance between two things. If we have the absolute value of n m minus n, if we have the absolute value of q minus r, that's a way of saying the distance between those two points. The absolute value of some object minus some other object is just a way of saying how far are those two objects from each other. That's one of the ideas that we had from absolute value. So when we say the absolute value of f of x minus l, what we're really saying is how far f of x and l are from each other. Now, it, that means with the combination of epsilon being greater than 0 and the distance between f of x and l being less than epsilon, what we're doing is we're saying there's this boundary around l. The maximum distance f of x can be from l, right? The distance between f of x and l has to be less than epsilon. This thing right here says the distance between our f of x and our l is less than epsilon, means that our f of x has to be within epsilon distance of l. So we effectively create a boundary that we hold f of x inside of. Whatever our f of x winds up being, it has to be somewhere inside of this boundary. If it is outside of the boundary, like this, that is not allowed because it would fail to be within epsilon distance of the L. So we wind up seeing we've got our L is here, and then the epsilons here are just the distance that we wind up having for that boundary. We are setting a boundary that is epsilon distance out from the L. But notice it has to be true for any epsilon that we set. So we will be able to create a boundary at whatever size we decide to make, whether it's a giant epsilon boundary or a really tiny epsilon boundary. It will always wind up working for this next part we're about to work towards.
Okay, so the second half of the definition, continuing with that, so previously we saw epsilon as a boundary around the height L, right? F of x minus L, the absolute value of f of x minus L is less than epsilon, means that f of x has to be at most, has to be less than the distance of epsilon from L. We know that we have to be somewhere contained inside of this boundary in here. Okay, now let's move on to looking at delta. So what does delta get us? All right, so what we did is we went and we set up for any real epsilon greater than zero, we had this boundary get up set up. So with that boundary in mind, we now have to go on to say that there exists some real delta greater than zero, such that for all x where zero is less than x minus c, which is less than delta, we will wind up having this absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon be true. So what we're doing, is we're putting a restriction on the allowed x values. The delta sets some restriction on you can't get any farther from c than delta. It, so what we're doing is we're saying, remember, x minus c, absolute value of x minus c is saying the distance between x and c. So the distance between x and c has to be less than delta. So if the distance between x and c is less than delta, that means that we've set up once again a boundary of how far our x is allowed to roam. And we know that what has to come out of this is we have to have, if we set x's within that boundary, we will wind up having the f of x minus l, absolute value of f of x minus l being less than epsilon. So if you use x's from inside of this boundary here, we know that we wind up having to be mapped into the f of x that's within that vertical boundary. So we're setting up some set of boundaries on what x's we can have, and we know for sure we have to have it so that they wind up getting mapped inside of this epsilon. The other thing to notice is that it says 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus c, that it's 0 is strictly less than the absolute value of x minus c, it means that x cannot be equal to c because then we have an absolute value of 0. We would have x equals c. But since it's a limit, we're not concerned with x equals c. Remember, we're not concerned with the destination, we're concerned with the journey. So that means we, have to, we care about the part with the boundary, but not the actual thing in the middle. That's what that 0 less than absolute value of x minus c means. So 0 less than absolute value of x minus c means that we're guaranteed we can't have x equal to c, and absolute value of x minus c is less than delta means that we are bounded delta distance at maximum delta distance from the c in that middle. And everything inside of it winds up getting mapped inside of this boundary here. It'll be easier to see what's going on if we erase some of this. So what we're doing here is we can think of it as some epsilon gets created. Some epsilon gets created around our L that sets up a boundary. So we know that you have to be somewhere on this portion vertically. And then we set some delta radius around our C so that it winds up mapping only to those vertical locations there. So we set epsilon and then we have to be able to always set some delta from that epsilon that will wind up mapping us inside of that vertical chunk. That we say that if we are close enough to this value of c, we will always be, always come out close enough to that value of l. Okay. Now, really important idea is that we can do this for any epsilon greater than zero whatsoever. That is, for any epsilon greater than zero, there has to exist some delta greater than zero. There has to exist some delta greater than zero, such that for x within delta of c, if we are close enough to c, f of x will wind up getting mapped within epsilon of l. If you're close enough to c, you'll wind up being close enough to l. We can imagine this process as a never-ending dialogue of epsilon challenges against delta defenses. Someone says, is it possible to stay within this distance of our L, and we say, yeah, as long as we're within this distance of our C. And then they say, okay, is it possible to stay within this distance of our L, this epsilon of our L? We say, yeah, as long as we're within delta distance of C. So some epsilon gets named, for any epsilon named, there has to be a delta that will cause us to stay within epsilon of wiggle room, within epsilon away from that L. Otherwise, if we can't do this, then the limit does not exist. But if we can do it forever and ever and ever, then that means that the limit does exist. If for any epsilon that gets named, there's always a delta, then that means the limit does exist. Now, of course, we can't actually have this process of 
Epsilon challenge, Delta defense. We can't do this forever. We can't do this for eternity. So we have to figure out another way to do this. If we wish to truly prove a limit, we have to prove that there will always be some Delta greater than zero given some Epsilon greater than zero. That if some Epsilon gets, na gets named, there's always a method that will create the appropriate Delta so that we can get within Epsilon of that limit L. Okay. Now, what we're going to go on to is we're going to see both of these ideas. So both of these ideas will be explored in the next scene that will be played out by Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. All right. The setting is late afternoon in Sherlock Holmes's apartment. He and Dr. Watson are lounging about. Let us play a game, Watson. All right, Holmes, what type of game? A game of limits. I do not believe I have ever... Do not worry, I shall teach it to you. We begin by setting up the game as follows. One of us, I in this case, claim the existence of a limit. I name some function f of x and some value l that the function will approach as x approaches some number c. Written out, we have the limit, the limit as x goes to c of f of x is equal to l. All right, that makes sense enough. Good. After that, the game in earnest begins. The opposing player, you in this case, names an epsilon greater than zero. It will then be the first player's job to name some delta greater than zero, such that for all values of x within delta distance of c, except x equals c, we don't care about x equals c in this game, they will cause f of x to be within epsilon of l. So if we use one of those x's that's within delta of c, we know that the f of x that will be produced by that x will have to be within epsilon of l. I think I understand. Let me write it out. I will name some epsilon greater than zero that sets up some boundary around L. So we have some L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon boundary, right? We're going to be in that interval vertically. Then you name a delta greater than zero such that for X contained within C minus delta to C plus delta, so that horizontal bounding, we will wind up getting f of x contained in L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. That is to say, the boundary that we set around L in the first place. I will set some boundary vertically, and then you will respond with some horizontal boundary that will put our function inside of that vertical boundary. Very good. Except one important thing. So except this important thing, we do not concern ourselves with x equal to c. For this game, x is not equal to c. We never actually consider x equaling c, so x is not equal to c generally. All right, I understand. You set up a limit, I challenge it with some epsilon greater than zero, and then you defend with some delta greater than zero. Uh, one question though, why can't epsilon equal zero? I understand delta must be greater than zero because we must have x not equal c, right? If delta is greater than zero, then we know that we can't actually be sitting on top of x equal c, so x is not equal to c. But why not epsilon equals zero? Because this is a game about limits. If you set epsilon equals to zero, we'd be stuck on L. We wouldn't have a boundary around it. We'd be stuck there. We need a boundary around L so we can talk about approaching it. The entire idea about a limit is to talk about going towards it, approaching it. It's similar to why we must have x not equal to c. Otherwise, there's no approaching it if we're stuck on top of it. So we can't be stuck on top of it, either vertically or horizontally. So that's why we can't have epsilon equal to zero or delta equal to zero. Makes sense. So what comes next? That's it. We stay with the same limit, but the process of epsilon challenges and delta defenses repeats for as long as we care to play. If you manage to give an epsilon that stumps me, you win. You'll have shown the limit false. Let us begin. What will your limit be? I choose the following limit to defend. Limit as x goes to 3 of x squared plus 2 equals 11. All right. I begin by challenging with uh, epsilon equals 1. I defend with delta equals 0 0.1. Since x contained within 2.9 to 3.1, the interval 2.9 to 3.1, notice that is a delta of 0.1 away from our c of x equals 3, c equals 3. If x is contained within 2.9 to 3.1, it will give f of x contained within 10.41 to 11.61, and that means I am easily within an epsilon value of 1 from our L of 11. Thus, my defense stands. Using delta equals 0.1, I stay within epsilon of 11. Okay, uh, how about epsilon equals 0 0.05? I'll go with delta equals 0 0.005. Since x contained within 2.995 to 3.005 causes f of x to be contained within 10.97 to 11.03, I'm within epsilon of 11, so my defense stands again. 
Uh, what if I try larger? I set epsilon equals 10. Nice try, old chap, but I already showed delta equals 0.1 works for epsilon equals 1. Therefore, it must work for epsilon equals 10 as well. If you start it out small and then you get bigger, well, I can just leave my delta the same, and it will work just fine for the larger vertical boundary as well. Thus, there is no hope for going larger with your epsilon. Since I've already shown that it works for a small epsilon, it will automatically work for a larger epsilon as well. Hmm. Fine, deal with this. Epsilon equals 0 0.000001. Elementary, my dear Watson. Delta equals 0 0.000001. Notice that if two x is contained within 2.9999999 to 3.000001, we will have f of x contained within 10.9999994 to 11.000000. .000000 6. That is to say, it will be contained within epsilon of 11. Thus, my defense is still standing. All right, Holmes, you have me convinced. I believe that no matter what epsilon I say, you will be able to defend with an appropriate delta. But technically, you haven't proven the limit. We can't play this game for eternity. So, how can you prove that delta will always exist? An astute question, Watson. The answer is by showing there exists some method to create delta from any given epsilon, and that the method never fails. I will tell you the method I'm using, and then show it always works. Of course, you already have a method. Naturally. Here it is. For any epsilon greater than or equal to 1, I will simply respond with delta equals 0.1. As we discussed earlier, delta equals 0.1 works for epsilon equals to 1, so it will work for any epsilon greater than or equal to 1. On the other hand, for epsilon between 0 and 1, that is 0 is less than epsilon, which is less than 1, I will use delta equals epsilon over 10. Oh wait, how do we know that delta is greater than 0? Well, we know epsilon is greater than 0. And since we're creating delta by dividing epsilon by 10, we know delta must be greater than, as, greater than 0 as well, right? If epsilon is greater than 0, then we know dividing something that's greater than 0 doesn't cause it to become 0 and doesn't cause it to become negative. It simply makes it smaller. So we know that delta must be greater than 0 as well because we simply divided something that was already greater than 0 by some positive number, in this case, positive 10. Now, let me prove to you that delta equals epsilon over 10 always works. Notice that since we're working with the function x squared plus 2, the values farthest from c equals 3 will produce the values farthest from l equals 11, because 3 squared plus 2 equals 11. Thus, we only have to concern ourselves with x equals 3 minus delta and x equals 3 plus delta, if that didn't quite make sense, Watson. What we've got here is 3. At some horizontal location, 3, we know that it spits out the vertical height of 11. So as we get farther and farther to either side, we will wind up getting farther and farther to 11. We know that this is a parabola. We're used to working with parabolas. So we see the farther we wind up getting away from c equals 3, the more extreme we are from c equals 3, the more extreme we will be from our l equals 11, right? That's how 3 squared plus 2 would work. As long as we don't go so incredibly far that we wind up wrapping the parabola to the other side, we're safe of this. We don't have to worry about it. So as long as we can be absolutely sure of that fact, where we don't go to negative 3, go past 0, we'll be fine. And we know that delta must be between 0.1, has to be less than or equal to 0.1 because of our earlier restriction on it always being less than or equal to 0.1. So we know we can't get too far. So the most extreme values for our x will wind up being using the whole of delta. That is, we only have to concern ourselves with x equals 3 minus delta and x equals 3 plus delta. Now, I want to point out before we continue, this logic is specific to the function we're working with, Watson. It's specific to working with x squared plus 2. The fact that as we get farther and farther away, horizontally, we will get farther and farther away vertically as well. So looking at maximum horizontal distance means maximum vertical distance. A different function, though, might require different logic. So we have to think specifically about the function we're working with if we're going to prove something. In this case, though, we see that this method will work. Thus, we can show that our delta equals epsilon over 10 works by showing that if we use the above x, that is x equals 3 minus delta and x equals 3 plus delta, if they both work in our function for being within epsilon of L, we must, so if we have that, that they wind up coming out like that, we know without a doubt that 
R delta will always work because it worked for the most extreme possible values. So we must show that the absolute value of 11 minus f of x, so in this case, if we're plugging in 3 minus delta and our f of x is x squared plus 2, we would have the absolute value of 11, our L, minus plugging in our function's maximum, most extreme possible value for x, that is quantity 3 minus delta squared plus 2, must be less than epsilon. Similarly, over here, for our other extreme value for x, x equals 3 plus delta, if we plug in our f of x, we have the L, we're going to 11, minus the quantity 3 plus delta squared plus 2 is less than epsilon. So those are the most extreme values there. We are doing the absolute value of 11, L minus f of x must be less than epsilon. That's what we want to show. So to show that this is the case, we will investigate the left sides of the expressions. So let's work with the 3 minus delta part first. So we have the absolute value of 11 minus quantity 3 minus delta squared plus 2. Let's begin by expanding 3 minus delta squared. So we expand 3 minus delta squared, and now we have the absolute value of 11 minus quantity 9 minus 6 delta plus delta squared, right? 3 minus delta squared gets us 9 minus 6 delta plus delta squared. We have minus here. And we have 9 and 2 inside, so minus 9 minus 2 cancels out the 11. We're left with minus 6 delta plus delta squared, but there's still this delta, uh, sorry, still, still this minus sign, so it distributes on canceling that, making this negative, and we have the absolute value of 6 delta minus delta squared when we plug in x equals 3 minus delta. Over here, the other one, we have the absolute value of 11 minus quantity 3 plus delta squared plus 2. We expand 3 plus delta squared, we get 9 plus 6 delta plus delta squared. So now we have the absolute value of 11 minus quantity 9 plus 6 delta plus delta squared plus 2. Once again, we are subtracting by what's inside of that, so the 9 and the 2 go together to combine and take out the 11. We're leaving us with 6 delta plus delta squared. The minus sign distributes. And we now have negative 6 delta minus delta squared if we had plugged in x equals 3 plus delta. So that is what the distance between L and our f of x is when we plug in our most extreme possible x's, 3 minus delta and 3 plus delta. Continuing from this, we can see that since 0 is less than delta, which is less than or equal to 0 0.1, remember we set delta must be less than or equal to 0 0.1 at the beginning because our most, the largest epsilon we were allowed to really care about was epsilon equal to 1, and we know delta equals 0 0.1 works there, so we always kept our deltas smaller than 0 0.1, and it, delta must be greater than 0. We can write the above as 6 delta minus delta squared and 6 delta plus delta squared. If you're not quite sure about this, since 6 delta, well, we know that delta must be greater than 0. Thus, 6 delta must be positive, and minus delta squared, well, delta squared must be smaller than delta because delta is less than or equal to 0.1. One, right? If we square something that is smaller than 1, it must wind up being smaller than had it not been squared. So 6 delta minus delta squared, well, 6 delta is positive, minus delta squared is negative, but smaller than 6 delta. So when we take the absolute value of this expression, we are left simply with 6 delta minus delta squared, even after the absolute value. Over here, we have negative 6 delta minus delta squared. Well, that means the negative 6 delta and the negative delta squared, they're both negative, so they combine forces. And after the absolute value is finished with them, they will wind up coming out as positive. So we'll have 6 delta plus delta squared. From this, we can create the following inequalities. The right side in this case being because delta is less than 0.1 implies that delta squared is less than delta, which we talked about very recently. If we have 6 delta minus delta squared, well, we've got 6 delta minus delta squared. Well, if we had 7 minus 5, that would clearly be less than simply 7 if we got rid of the thing subtracting from it. So we just get rid of the thing subtracting it, and we have 6 delta minus delta squared is less than 6 delta. That's certainly true. Furthermore, since delta squared is less than delta, we have that 6 delta plus delta squared is less than 6 delta plus delta, which is the same thing as 7 delta. So we now know that 6 delta plus delta squared is less than 7 delta. At this point, we can use our delta equals epsilon over 10 that we originally set. And we have 6 delta is equal to 6 epsilon over 10. Remember, that's less than the most extreme value. And 6 epsilon over 10 is clearly less than epsilon. Furthermore, the other most extreme value was going to be less than 7 delta. And we have 7 epsilon over 10, which is indeed less than epsilon. Thus, we have shown that plugging in our most extreme values will show that the distance between f of x and l is always less than epsilon. We plug in our most extreme possible value, that gives us our most extreme possible vertical distance, and it still winds up being less than epsilon when we work the whole thing through. So the method of choosing delta 
always works. We see that this delta equals epsilon over 10. It will always work. It will never fail. Very good, Holmes. My only question is, how did you decide on setting epsilon equals uh, delta equals epsilon over 10 in the first place? How did you think epsilon over 10? That's the thing for me. Indeed, that is the most difficult part of proving a limit. In general, once you have a sense of how the function works, it helps to set it up as if you knew what delta was. As you work forward, you'll find its requirements. For example, with this limit, I realized whatever delta was, whatever I wound up choosing for delta, it would wind up having to get to the point where we found out, see, we would see that 6 delta plus delta squared had to be less than epsilon. So if 6 delta plus delta squared had to be less than epsilon, I could restrict delta less than or equal to 0 0.1, because smaller delta will never cause any harm, and see that 6 delta plus delta squared would be the same thing as saying that is less than 7 delta, and 7 delta would certainly be would certainly work if delta was epsilon over 10. I could have gone with epsilon over 7, but I figured why not have a little bit of wiggle room, and epsilon divided by 10 just seems so nice and round. So I saw that delta equals epsilon over 10 would do fine, at which point I was prepared to work through the proof. Ha! Ah, I'm feeling a mite peckish. Nothing like a good proof to develop the appetite. What are you in the mood for, Watson? Somehow, I find myself craving Greek. Excellent, good. A brace of euros it will be. They make their exit for the neighborhood euro shop. All right, so with Sherlock Holmes and Watson having helped us see what's going on here, the idea of an epsilon challenge, a delta defense, and how to prove this stuff in general by showing this delta method will always give us a delta that works, we're ready to start working through some examples. So our first example below is the graph of f of x equals x times sine of 1 over x. First, we needed to determine if the function has a limit as x goes to 0, and if so, find it and prove it. So we can see right from the beginning, it looks like it's going to zero, right? We can see from the graph, this nice convenient graph, that yeah, sure, it looks like it's going to wind up having a limit. So it would appear to be the case. However, we notice that we can't simply plug in, we can't simply plug in x equals zero, right? If we did that, we'd have zero times sine of one over zero. We're dividing by zero, so f of zero does not exist. So we can't simply go down that method. We can't simply plug in a number and figure out what's going to come out. So we have to show this by proving it directly. We have to go and see this is going to always work. We have to figure out a way. So we can see from the graph, yeah, it makes sense that it's going to wind up coming out to be zero, but it will be on our shoulders to now prove it through a good proof. Let's try to get an understanding of why this thing looks like this, right? We can see from the graph that it looks like this, but let's see what's going on. So what we can do is we can break this down into multiple pieces. So we can first see this as sine of, well, let's look actually first, 1 over x. What is 1 over x graph as? Well, 1 over x is going to wind up graphing something like this, right? We're going to go asymptotic as we approach that vertical axis. Then how does sine of some value graph? Well, sine of some value winds up graphing like this. It has that nice repeating nature. If you watched the last lesson, you probably wound up seeing this in the previous lesson. We talked about just sine of 1 over x and how it freaked down and came really, really close. So that's the same idea so far. We've got that part going on so far. So if we plug these two things in, if we plug 1 over x in for sine of t, then what we're concerned with as we get close to 0, as x goes to 0, is we're concerned with that part that's getting close to that. So if we wind up looking at that, if we look at sine of 1 over x, we're going to wind up getting this part where as it's far away from zero, it's going to wind up going sort of slowly, but as it gets closer, it's going to speed up and it's going to start to freak out and it's going to bounce back and forth between one and negative one really, really fast because it's got to go through all of infinity, right? We shoot off to infinity as we get towards zero. So since it's shooting off towards infinity, one over x is shooting off towards infinity inside of the sign. So the sign's now going to have to speed up faster and faster and faster because it has to go through all of infinity by the time it makes it to zero. So we see the same thing from both sides. It shoots and gets really, 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 really fast, bouncing up and down. And so that's the behavior we see. If it was simply sine of 1 over x, it wouldn't have a limit, as we talked about in the previous lesson, because it's never going to agree on a single location that it's working towards. However, in this case, we also have x showing up. Well, if we graph just x, what does just x look like? Well, that looks just like this, right? So x times something is going to wind up sort of 
expanding it or shrinking it by whatever x's current value is. So as x gets closer and closer to zero, it's going to wind up squishing it and squishing it and squishing it closer and closer to that x-axis. Now notice, sine always produces values, sine of anything always produces values that is going to be between negative one and positive one, right? Based on how the unit circle works and what we can see from the graph of just sine. So what we're going to have is either a positive x effectively or a negative x. So if we graph in that negative x, let's plug, so here's negative x in green. Then as we plug in x times sine of 1 over x, it's going to sort of get back, the maximum value that it can have is whatever the x is that it's next to. So as it gets far away, it winds up bouncing between these things. But as it gets closer and closer and closer, it winds up bouncing faster and faster and faster and faster. But because there's that x, it shrinks it down and sort of crushes it to go down to zero. So it's not actually going to be defined at x equals zero, but it will wind up being crushed into this point right here. So with all of these ideas in mind, we can now say that the limit as x goes to zero of x times sine of 1 over x equals zero. We figured out, yes, it does have a limit. It makes sense. We understand what's going on in a, in a thing that now makes sense with this graph. And notice you can also see the x is going out like this in the graph. And the negative x goes out here. So this nice computer generated graph, we wind up seeing the same behavior of the sine bouncing infinitely quickly gets trapped between positive x and negative x because it has to multiply x times sine of 1 over x. So now we see this is what our limit winds up being. And at this point, we can try to work out a proof here. So if we're going to prove that this is the case, then it must be that for any epsilon greater than 0, there exists some delta that will wind up making us within that appropriate distance of our epsilon, of our vertical epsilon. So for any epsilon greater than zero, what delta do we choose? What's the appropriate method? Well, notice if we go back to our x. Here's x. Here's a graph of x once again. And I'll also map the negative x here as well. Sorry, that should be dots all the way through. If we have negative x and x mapped here. Well, what's the biggest thing that x allows? Well, the biggest thing that x is going to allow that sign to get expanded out to is whatever x currently is. So for any epsilon greater than zero, if we want to talk about the maximum vertical size we can allow, then we can allow x to go out as far as that epsilon, and that will be the maximum allowed vertical size. So we can simply say that our delta, since that's how far out our x can go from zero, is simply equal to epsilon. So we set delta equals epsilon. Now it's going to be our job. What we want to show now is that for any f of x minus l, it's going to be less than epsilon if we have our x within delta distance of our c. All right, so let's start working through this. We can swap out what f is and what L is, and we can swap things out, and we can start working to showing that this is true. So f of x minus L, what's the left side there? f of x is this guy right here, x times sine of 1 over x. So x times sine of 1 over x minus L. Well, L is just 0 in this case, so minus 0 just closes up, and we have that it's less than epsilon. So at this point, we can look at this and we can go, well, x times sine of 1 over x. The absolute value of all of that is just going to be the same thing as the absolute value of x times the absolute value of sine of 1 over x, right? If we strip any possible negative sides after they've multiplied or strip any possible negative sides before they multiply, it's not going to have an effect on the product. So we have that this thing right here, oh, we don't know that it's less than epsilon. What we want to show is that it comes out to be less than epsilon. We will work towards showing that. Sorry about that. So the absolute value of x times sine of 1 over x, well, that's just the same thing as x times absolute value of x times the absolute value of sine of 1 over x. Well, what is the absolute value of sine of 1 over x? Well, the absolute value of sine of 1 over x, well, the absolute value of sine of anything, absolute value of sine of anything at all is going to be less than or equal 
to 1, right? You can't get larger than 1 or larger than negative 1 when you plug something into sine. So the absolute value of sine of 1 over x is going to still be less than or equal to 1, except for that specific value of x equals 0, which would cause the whole thing to break. But we don't have to worry about that because it's x going to 0. So we have 0 is less than x minus c. So we don't have to worry about x equals 0. So we know that sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to 1 will always be true because we don't have to worry about actually plugging in x equals 0. So we can now use this information up here, and we have that the absolute value of x times the absolute value of sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to, we swap out that fact that sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to 1, and we have the absolute value of x times 1. So absolute value of x times the absolute value of sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to the absolute value of x times simply 1. So we have that's just the same thing as saying x. Great. Now at this point, we also know that x minus c is less than delta. Let's use yet another color here. So if absolute value of x minus c, well, what's our c? Our c is equal to 0 in this case, because that's what we're going towards. So we have that the absolute value of x minus 0, well, we'll just leave it as the absolute value of x, has to be less than delta. So the absolute value of x is less than delta. We can now swap that in here. And we have that the absolute value of x is less than delta. What did we set our delta to? We know delta is equal to epsilon because that's what we decided to make our method. So we have that's equal to epsilon. So at this point, we have now shown that the absolute value of x times sine of 1 over x gets to being less than or equal to x, which we know is less than delta, which has to, which delta is equal to epsilon, but at this point we can stack together our signs. The most extreme sign that we wound up having was that direct strictly less than. So at this point we now see that the absolute value of x times sine of 1 over x is indeed, oops, close that absolute value, is indeed less than epsilon. So that always winds up being true if we use this method. So we have now completed our proof. This limit does indeed work out. We've shown that Whatever epsilon we wind up choosing, there will always be an appropriate delta. If we simply set delta equals epsilon, it will wind up satisfying any and every epsilon. So thus, we have completed the proof. The limit does exist. The limit is indeed zero. Awesome. All right, second example. And there's only going to be two of these examples total because they clearly take a little while to get through. Consider the piecewise function f of x equals 1 when x is rational, negative 1 when x is irrational. Prove that f of x has no limit anywhere. So the very first thing we want to do here before we try to prove anything is we want to understand just what the heck does f of x equals 1 when x is rational, negative 1 when x is irrational mean. So, well, first off, we need to remember what does it mean for a number to be rational? A number is rational when it can be put as some a over b where a and b are integers. That's what it means for a number to be rational. A number is irrational when it can't be expressed as a rational. So a rational means any decimal number that has a fixed length to it. Also decimals that wind up having repeating patterns, but will actually be enough with just a fixed length to understand what's going on here. So, you know, 2.0000000001 stop is a rational number. An irrational number is a decimal number, or something that can be expressed as a decimal number, where the decimals continue going on forever, they never establish a single pattern, and they just constantly are changing forever and ever and ever. For example, pi, 3.14152, blah, 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 well, not two, anyway, 3.1415, blah, 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 stuff going on forever, uh, square root of two, e, we've seen some irrational numbers that are pretty important, but they're also everywhere total, right? Imagine we had that rational at 2.0000001, but we could also have an irrational that's right next to it practically. It's 2.0000001 and then a random string forever and ever like 1, 5, 8, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 5, 8, 3, 3. Like it just keeps changing and changing and changing. So we can have an irrational number right next to any rational number, right? We can get as close as we want to any irrational number. And we can get as close as we want to any irrational with a rational by just putting as many decimals as we want and then stopping at a certain point. So the rationals and the irrationals are right next to each other everywhere total, right? Every single place on the number line has a rational and then an irrational effectively like 
infinitely close to it. And then a, irra a rational right next to that, and an irrational right next to that, everything's just infinitely mashed together. Two isn't both irrational and irrational. Two is simply rational. But right next to it is an irrational, right? You can get as close to as you want with 2.000 random pattern. And then you can get as close as you want to 2.000 random pattern with a rational like 2.000 stop, right? It, it, matching the random pattern, 2.000, match the first 50,000 digits of the random pattern and then stop, and that's still going to be a rational number because it's technically an integer divided by an integer, right? It'll be a large integer divided by a large power of 10, but it's still technically an integer over an integer, so it's going to be a rational number. So what that means is rationals and irrationals are right next to each other everywhere. So if we tried to graph this, what would f of x wind up looking like? Well, we wind up having something that looked like this, where let's say we use blue when one x is rational. So we're going to wind up having everything that winds up being irrational will wind up coming out at 1, right? So there's always going to be points, but between any point and the next point over, it's going to wind up having a little tiny hole for the irrationals. And where do the irrationals show up? Well, they show up at negative 1. So we wind up having the same thing here. And so down below them, are our irrationals. And so there's a bunch of irrationals. There's infinitely many irrationals down there. There's infinitely many rationals up here. And they both just are right next to each other, right? You're constantly jumping back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth if we were trying to plot this thing out, right? It's certainly not continuous because it's two things simultaneously. So why can't we have a limit? Now let's try to think about why will there be no limit anywhere? Well, consider if we tried to talk about some location C, then that means that location C would have to be in either the top or the bottom. And if it wound up being in either the top or the bottom, let's just say the top for argument's sake, then that means we can put some epsilon boundary that is small enough to contain just one of these, right? We make epsilon equal to a half or something, so it can just contain one of these strings, one of these height strings, one of these lines. So since it can only contain one of these lines, no matter what delta we wind up choosing, right? We choose any delta, then we're going to wind up having points that are both on the bottom and the top. So if we were in the top, we can make something, we can make epsilon only contain the top, but whatever delta size we choose, since the rationals and the irrationals are right next to each other, if we have some rationals, we have to have some irrationals with it as well. If we have some irrationals, we have to have some rationals with it as well, right? Whatever, if you catch this stuff, it's got both types no matter what, if you take any interval chunk of it. So since delta will always produce some interval chunk, it has to have both rationals and irrationals in that interval chunk. So we grab a chunk and it's going to have both the top and the bottom, even though we've restricted our epsilon to only contain either the top or the bottom. And this is the idea of why there can be no limit anywhere, is because we can always choose an epsilon that's going to only take either the top or the bottom line, but no matter what delta we wind up choosing, we're going to have to be in both the top and the bottom lines, so we won't be stuck just inside of that epsilon. It will fail to wind up being a, uh, wind up being a limit, to having a limit. So if we're going to actually prove this formally, that'll be a little bit difficult, but understanding the idea, that's 90% of the battle. I would much prefer that you understand this idea and the limit doesn't make, and the proof doesn't make sense, then you really, really work hard through the proof and have a vague understanding of doing the proof, but you don't understand the idea of the limit. At this point, the most important thing by far, and probably ever, the most important thing by far is understanding the general idea and having a sense of what's going on rather than being able to do the specific mechanics. The specific mechanics can always come later. Understanding the idea, that's gold. All right, but let's work through those specific mechanics. Okay, proof by contradiction. So how do we show this? We will show that assume it is possible, and then we will see that if we were to assume it is impossible, crazy impossible things will occur. That if this were true, that we did have a limit, then it won't work. It just doesn't make any sense, and so we will have contradicted it, and we will know that it must be the case that the limit cannot exist. So what we do, we begin by assuming there will be a lot of writing for this, I'm sorry. Assume there exists, so assume there exists some limit that as x goes to c, our f of x is equal to some value of l. Then, for any epsilon greater than zero, by the definition of how a limit works, we know there exists some delta greater than zero, such that, and from here on out when I write such that, I will probably just use s dot t if I have to write that again, such that 
for any zero less than the absolute value of x minus c less than delta. That is to say, a x that is less than delta distance away from whatever our c happens to be. We know it must be the case that the absolute value of f of x minus l, that is the distance between the f of x that gets mapped from that x and l, what our limit goes to, has to be less than epsilon. So that has to be true. Right? That's what it means for it to have a limit. If there exists a limit, then it must be that for any epsilon greater than zero, there will always exist a delta greater than zero, such that if x is within delta of c, f of x must be within epsilon of l. That's what the formal definition is. Now, let us consider, let me actually change colors because now we're sort of changing ideas. That was the setup to this thing. So the next thing is consider epsilon equals one half. So let's consider epsilon equals one half. So therefore, there must exist by this thing up here for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero such that it does this thing here. So there exists delta greater than zero such that it follows this idea right here. Okay, now let's continue to talk about this epsilon equal to one half. So this epsilon equal to one half, notice, by the absolute value of f of x minus l being less than epsilon, we have, so notice that the absolute value of f of x minus l being less than one half must be either, well, what are the possible values that can come out of f of x? One and negative one. So it must be either the absolute value of one minus L is less than one half, or the absolute value of negative one minus L is less than one half. The distance that our f of x is from L must be less than one half. So either one minus L is less than one half or negative one minus L is less than one half. That's what absolute value of f of x minus L less than one half has to come out meaning. But also notice, so further, so only one of these can be true. Right? So these two ideas right here, absolute value of one of minus L is less than one half, and negative one minus L is less than one half, they can't both be true. Because if our L is within one half of negative one, it can't possibly also reach to being one half of one. And if our L is within one half of one, it can't possibly also be within one half of negative one, right? It has to pick one of the two bands. Our L can't be one half away from both bands because one and negative one are two apart. So if you are within one of them, you can't be near both of them, right? So it can't be near both of them. So only one of these can be true. So only one can be true. We're going to use that fact very soon. Only one can be true. Now we go on to say, well, there existed some delta greater than zero such that it made zero is less than the absolute value of x minus c less than delta means that absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So by our delta, by our delta we know that zero is less than x minus c, which is less than delta, and that that winds up having to mean that the absolute value of f of x minus l has to be less than our one half, right? This thing right here. We know that our delta has to wind up making our f of x within one half of l since we set our epsilon as one half. But zero, whoops, zero, is less than x absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, that is to say x is within delta of c, must contain rational and irrational x, right? Since we know that delta has to be greater than zero and our x is within delta of c, it's within some interval of x minus c to x plus c, right? We've got, we know that x is going to be, sorry, x, uh, c minus delta. So it's going to be within the interval c minus delta to c plus delta. Well, any interval, because remember, rationals and irrationals are right on top of each other. Then that means our interval, this interval here, 
the one set up by 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus c, which is less than delta, must contain both rational and irrational x values. So if it contains both rational and irrational x values, we know our f of x, because it has to be true for any x in this interval, and since we contain both rational and irrational, we now have 1 and negative 1 popping out of our f of x. So thus, the absolute value of 1 minus l is less than 1 half, and the absolute value of one, negative 1 minus l is less than 1 half must be true simultaneously. Because we know that within our delta bound, we know we're going to have both rational and irrationals. And anything within that delta bound, by the definition, for any epsilon greater than 0, there exists delta greater than 0, such that if you're contained within that boundary of delta, it must map within that boundary of epsilon. So we know we're contained within that boundary of delta. We're contained within c minus delta to c plus delta. But there's going to be rational and irrationals in there. So that means it has to contain our epsilon uh, boundary must contain both 1 and negative 1. So the absolute value of 1 minus L must be less than 1 half, and the absolute value of negative 1 minus L must be less than 1 half. But only one can be true, right? This and this are mutually exclusive, because you can't be in both bands at once if the band can only be a total distance of 1 wide around positive 1 or around negative 1, right? 1 half down, 1 half up, they don't manage to reach each other. They can't reach across, so you can't wind up being in both bands at once with that epsilon of 1 half. So it says that they must be true simultaneously, but we know that only one can be true. So since only one can be true, and we know that they have to be true simultaneously, those are impossible statements to be true at the same time. We have a contradiction. There is a contradiction in our logic. And because we know everything else in our logic was flawless except for our assumption that there existed some limit, we know, therefore, no delta can exist that will satisfy epsilon equal to 1 half. So no limit can exist. And we have completed our proof. All right, I think that's really cool. It's not for everyone, but I think it's so beautiful. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got a cool sense of this. And remember, what we talked about here is not something that is necessary for virtually any students. Certainly no student currently at a pre-calculus level. If you're just in the level of this course, you don't need to know this stuff. I'm, I'm honest, you, I, I won't have to use this stuff at all. It's going to maybe, maybe, maybe wind up showing up when you take calculus, but probably not even then. It's really something that you only need if you're getting into advanced math. However, I think this stuff is so cool, and there's no reason that if you wind up liking this stuff, it's like going and checking out art for me. If you wind up liking this stuff, you might as well check it out any time that you wind up being able to enjoy it. It's really cool stuff. It gets your brain thinking in all these totally new ways, and you can wind up exploring this stuff for years and years and years. You can make an entire career out of exploring this stuff. If you think this is kind of cool, you can study mathematics in college, go on to really like become a mathematician and just study math for the rest of your life. There's a whole bunch of other stuff to explore. Math is really, really cool. All right. See you at educator.com later. Bye.